Thanks a lot. I would like, before you go into the panel discussions, uh, to give you a feedback on the poll and uh, on what the audience um, was responding on our question, what is the main lever for the translation of research to the market? And it's changing constantly, but um, the main lever seems to be for the audience to have a good regulatory frameworks favoring innovation. Nevertheless, shortly followed and just one minute ago they were still at the same position also the question of funding great um i would like to to let you know that there is already one first question also for the panel and i would like also to um well to remind everyone uh in the audience to not to forget that you can participate actively in the discussions um simply by sending your questions in the session chat and please use the right uh, session chat okay i hand over to the two moderators thanks a lot thank you monica so i'm happy to introduce now the panel session and uh, first i'd like to thank the two speakers the previous speakers you know thank you for introducing uh, our topic very nicely and now i am really excited to introduce um, two new um, uh, panelists you know who are joining us so one uh, the first one is aurelie grinenberger and uh, aurelie she's a phd she holds a phd in chemistry and biology she has an extensive experience in uh, pharma industry and uh, being in europe or in the us experience in the us as well she's also now experienced in the um, small companies and uh, she is the chief uh, business officer at eligo bioscience and uh, Oli, welcome to, to this panel. And maybe I just give you the word to introduce, not to introduce further yourself, but what, what, what speaks to you when you, you hear about the ecosystem and entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial ecosystem and the perspective from where you are sitting now in a, in a small company? Thank you, Oli. Thank you, Saladin. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, um, if I may, Eligo Bioscience just. Uh, gives you a sense of how the ecosystem can work to actually bring innovation. So we're a biotech company. We're, we're pioneering gene therapy of the microbiome. We're using a proprietary technology platform that we call Illegal Biotics. And just uh, for uh, understanding, uh, these Illegal Biotics is a new therapeutic modality that um, is based on delivery of DNA uh, into bacterial population of a microbiome using particles that are derived from bacteriophage, which are virus. And so the idea is to modulate the composition of a function of the microbiome to treat disease where the microbiome has been shown to be a key contributor. And so it's very technologically driven. It, there's a lot of science behind that. And so um, the, actually, Eligo was founded in 2014 by scientists from the Rockefeller University and MIT. Uh, we're backed by venture capital funding, uh, both West Coast uh, US, uh, Koshla Venture and Se Venture, who is Paris based. Uh, we have had non dilutive funding from the European Commission, from Carbex, who's a funding uh, from uh, the US, from BPI France, who's the national Paris uh, French national uh, uh, funding. Um, um, bank and and we just announced a partnership with GSK uh, in Acne. So you can see here just like by moving, progressing a company that's now seven years in the making uh, through its different stage, we have had to interact with um, you know in universities with funding authorities, whether they are public or private ca capital, with also uh, pharma partners. And so it takes an entire ecosystem to advance innovative solution. That you know, we have strong relationship with experts in the field of the microbiome because it's such an emerging field. We need to have uh, both uh, academic and clinician input to what we're doing. It's vital for us to advance our programs, to develop new ones. Uh, it's through research collaboration, uh, through access to patient sample data, to streamline a clinical study with the input or even to represent a clinical perspective when we meet with regulators. So uh, both academia and clinician um, can bring value to uh, innovation and, and we exchange value actually. Um, and if I may, from my pre-pass, we had, um, we had um, 
uh, at Sanofi, where I was, we had very similar interactions with um, academia and clinicians. So industry as a whole, whether it's startup or, um, or pharma, welcomes collaboration with academic. Um, the last piece I want to say is we have, of course, regular discussion with pharma, which is one of our main customers, and their insights helps us to make sure we approach uh, the market the right way. It, it helps us steer our uh, application of our technology platform. But as a pharma company, such interactions help them monitor and ultimately acquire innovation to support this pipeline. So it's really uh, very much uh, uh, netted or ecosystem at this point. And everybody recognizes the value of in collaborating. Thank you, Orly. Thank you very much. Um, so, and um, I will introduce our next uh, panelist now, who has just joined us. So, Fabrice André, who is uh, who is holding an MD PhD. His area of expertise is in the oncology area. He's a professor and uh, involved in research. And I think what is interesting with your background and it's very broad and diverse. So, he's involved in uh, biology, professor in biology and research, but as well as responsible for clinical trials from phase one to phase three. So you look at the both areas and I think especially in the breast cancer area. So uh, Fabrice, welcome to this uh, to this panel. Maybe you can also share some um, some of your perspectives about with your where you are sitting, you know, in the uh, I, I should have mentioned at Gustave Roussy in Paris. We are virtually in Paris all here today. So <laughs> and uh, you are physically present in Paris already. So maybe you can tell us more about what, what what you do and and the perspective from the ecosystem and how important it is to have uh, the different players you know um, um, are working together. Thank you, Paris, and welcome. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. So uh, maybe some I would say minor points, but that are important for us. So first, for me, it took me 45 years before knowing what is being entrepreneur. So I think the first point is to integrate the culture of entrepreneuriat as soon as you know medical school or uh, you know uh, university etc it's a key element if people they don't have this culture they will never think about moving to uh, their data into in, into companies second point from the perspective of a big comprehensive cancer center what we are missing is internal champions so now more and more what we try to do for our partnership with big companies is to have, you know, interface with the companies that are employees of Gustav Lucy, but specifically dedicated to the work with one specific company. And we even dedicate space to companies inside the hospital. If we don't have this, it's very difficult that uh, our employees can dedicate time to, uh, to, to, to the industry. Point number three, of course, is how to develop a startup from uh, our science, our research. And for this, more and more, you know, I believe in a integrated, uh, in a kind of bio cluster and this uh, integrated ecosystem uh, geographically, I mean. So I think for me, this is a very important point. We cannot go to uh, everywhere in the world to find some investors or collaborators, etc. So I think more and more, I believe in this idea that we need to develop some big clusters to to create the the, the, the ecosystem. And last point, uh, what we are trying to do now here uh, is really to go to develop interface. Things are happening at the basic science uh, side, so in the universities. So more and more we develop with university tools to drive very basic science things to cancer application. We think the value is, is really here, creating interface between very basic science and translational research. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Fabrice. And uh, so we welcome you both, you know, to the panel, joining the other two speakers. And now I'm handing it to um, over to André, who will start to ask uh, specific questions. And we will get questions, of course, from the audience. Please do not hesitate to send your, send your questions to us. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Saladin, and thank you all for your uh, perspectives and talks, and especially for your presence and contribution uh, to, to this panel. So the panel is open, and I will start uh, by industry. I would like to address a question to Magda. Uh, Magda, you talk about, just in the beginning of your, of your presentation, you talk about translational challenges 
And also you mentioned the, the importance of collaborations using the recent uh, COVID situation as an example and how this make all the process uh, very fast. So in fact, there is a growing uh, consensus uh, that translation research uh, at the academic level uh, can enhance many aspects of pharmaceutical development. But it's also true that industry emerges, uh, emerges not only as a source of innovation, but also as an important vehicle uh, to catalyze this knowledge transfer coming from academia to the patients and ultimately for, for the market. So in your industry perspectives, which rules you will select the most important ones in order to establishing successful partnerships with academia? In other words, which models are the best? And then I have a provocative question to you, specifically related to personalized medicine. In how do you evaluate the potential outcomes for industry in the implementation of personalized medicine uh, and the engagement with academia in this setting? Okay, to, it, it's a challenge. Thank you. Thank you for the question. So um, let me start with the first one. I don't think that one, one size fits all and that there is one model of collaboration that would work because it really very much depends on what you want to achieve. You can go into more institutional, broader partnership if your journey requires an alignment on standards and methodologies. You may go into bilateral if your objective is to take your technology to the next level of upscaling. So it all very much depends on what you want to achieve. So I wouldn't say that there is one model that, uh, that, it's, that it's appropriate for anything. Even the current COVID situation had shown that the various translational challenges were addressed in a very different way, either through institutional partnerships or through bilateral collaborations or through pulling funding together. But I think all of them have a couple of uh, criteria or performance indicators that I would like to quickly spell out. The first one is to really well understand what, what do you have uh, what is your asset? What is its value that you want really to bring to that next step? And sometimes um, it's just, you know, by 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 trial and error, um, the, the, uh, the trial and error thing doesn't doesn't always work. So really understanding what you have in hand and what is it that you want to do. The second is clear goal of the collaboration. Um, where do you want to get? What is the vision? What is the future state? What is it supposed to have as an impact ultimately? Because that would define with whom you want to collaborate and what you want to do. The third one is win-win. A collaboration must have a win for everybody in the collaboration. Uh, for those who come to ask, for those who, who come to give. I mean, after all, if the collaboration isn't a win-win, it's not a collaboration, it's a subcontracting thing and, and, and that's that's not a real, real engagement. So I think the win-win, the creating, really defining from the beginning of the road, what is it in, in it for everyone is super important. That brings me to the clear rules of engagement, making sure what has the roles and responsibilities of everyone and putting some skin in the game. You know, if we don't bring our resources, if we don't bring in something that 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 in a way keeps us on track um, because because there is an investment, it doesn't work. Then the clear business model and intellectual property rules from the get go. Everybody needs to feel safe and to know what would happen with their assets once it is developed. And there are many, many models of that and all of them work for very specific situations. Finally, I would like to start with the end. So with sustainability, you need to know your end goal in order to plan everything along the way properly. So if you want deployment, you need to engage accordingly. You need to choose your partners who would help you to get to that place of deployment. I'm thinking about institutional partnerships and standards, but that is true for everything. And again, in personalized medicine, precision medicine, it's even more important than anything else because you start with the patient, so everything is put upside down. You need to start with the end and then plan all the steps and choose your partners according to what is the impact that you want to have. And then you have your clear goal, your win-win, your engagement rules, your conflicts of interest, your IPR and everything that follows. So I would stop here on that one. I hope that helps. On your second question, that's... Um, maybe a bit trickier. Um, OK, so let me try to, to reply as follows. Precision medicine is supposed to or 
will definitely in in the in the eyes of of industry who works on that to improve patient outcomes to bring socioeconomic benefits and to bring some cost efficiency for these benefits to materialize the industry needs to gain in agility and i'll come to that in a second but the, the healthcare systems also need to be prepared to take up what's coming so it's not just you know the, the the it's not just about the industry it is about the ecosystem and is the ecosystem ready for that so on the industry side when the smaller players who do not have the big infrastructure and the legacy behind them when they enter the field they start with a clean slate so they can build their 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 logistics their ecosystem accordingly for the bigger companies that can be perceived by some as destroying their business models, but actually that's not the case. The companies would not go in, in with uh, personalized medicine, with precision medicine everywhere. Um, so they would, and they do, as far as I understand it, they do create specific infrastructures for personalized medicine, and therefore they sort of start with a clean slate and create all the infrastructure in order to have that agility that is necessary to go into the precision medicine. So I don't think that it would have any negative impact on business. I think just that um, the business would be different um, and, uh, and, uh, and everything needs to follow but especially the healthcare systems around us um, and the infrastructure around us needs to follow. It's not just about the science developing companies and products, but it's also about the traction through the healthcare systems. Hope that replies to your question. Yes, totally. Thank you very much, Magda. And Magda, you mentioned uh, a very important word there, or two words, win-win situation. This kind of collaborations has to be win-win situation in other in, in other cases, it's not it's not a collaboration if both parts cannot benefit from from this kind of relations between clinicians, between academics, and between industry. And we also talk about responsibilities and engagements. And this is really important when we when we talk about academia and relations between academia and industry. And saying that, I would like to to ask um, Viara. Um, we are both researchers and. Um, and we decide to be at the interface uh, position in the center of this uh, ecosystem, innovation ecosystem. So I believe that you agree if I say that there is a frequent lack of understanding from the researcher's side on what it takes to properly translate uh, their findings to the market. And when I say market, I say industry, I say healthcare system, or even developing their own business. So you talk, you mentioned confusion from the academic perspective. So I'd like to hear uh, a little bit more about this. In your opinion, which are the main barriers you see in this process of getting research motivated? Because I feel in my side that sometimes we don't get just motivation. They don't know how to do it, so they, they, are, not, they are not motivated to do it. So which are the main barriers you see in this process of getting researchers more motivated and engaged with innovation process in the industry and in clinicians? It's a problem of IP management, they don't know what they expect, is scientific, is regulatory guidance, or just difficulties match, matching their scientific findings with the market needs, because that's why units like yours and, 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 and my unit are here too. So I would like to hear a bit more on that. Thank you very much. Um, I think you're right. I think it's a combination of, of a number of factors. Um, in terms of engagement, I think it was mentioned before that I think it, it I think it should start at undergrad level, undergraduate level. The students should be taught about um, the the real life of healthcare. You know, I did a degree in molecular biology in the 90s. I was not taught anything about this. I started taking interest doing my PhD um, through courses that were available in my university, and I did you know, absorb them really quickly and and kind of started developing an interest in this space. And you know, 20 years on, it's still extracurricular in most cases. So integrating into curriculum at the very early stage. So by the time those young students become early career researchers, they understand the landscape a lot better. There's certainly still a big driver in saying academia is best. So if you are not a professor by the time you're 40, you've failed. Um, I mean, it's a bit harsh, but I think there's uh, paraphrasing. I think there is a sense of you either follow an academic path or, or you're not a good scientist, which is slowly we're breaking those barriers through just saying there's a big old world out there and that you can 
create impact. And I think the impact element is the, the element that it's actually starting to convert, convert a lot of the academics saying, yes, I would like to see my um, uh, research to be impactful. You know, the fact that um, the research, uh, the funding giving bodies are now starting to ask much more specific questions around what is the impact going to be? How are we going to do this? Answer the question specifically. The building of the sort of on, um, enterprise units across various institutions, whether they're big like at Imperial or much smaller in some smaller institutions, it doesn't really matter. Is the guidelines through that path um, and exposure? And I think I would I would completely agree the proximity, co-location with um, and, and the ecosystem uh, that is all everyone's together. You know, uh, people from industry, whether it's biotech or pharma, sort of large or small, coming in, talking to students and researchers, and just mixing and mingling is to understand that it's all really research, and everyone's trying to translate it into the um, real world. I think that's probably a challenge. There is an element of still of some some um, the researchers are, are still confused, saying, "Oh, does that mean I need to give up my academic career?" And you know, there's an element of hand holding that we have to help um, academics understand how they can work in, so to speak, both worlds. But it is very slowly disappearing. I've been in this game for 20 years. It was a lot worse 20 years ago. Now it's a lot better. And I think through that effort of the both curricular, extracurricular teaching and offering support um, along the way. And one thing that's happened um, in the UK, and I, I, I'm sure it's, it's, it's spreading globally, we have a consortium of industry and academia and government came together to put together contracts that make it a lot easier to, to collaborate. So we are governed now. All the universities are obliged to start using those contracts. This has been going for about seven or eight years, and it's really helped bring because both parties have contributed to how that's contracted. And I know it might sound trivial, and for most academics, it's not something they'll think about when they talk to a, a collaborator in industry, but it can be the barrier to actually create a successful partnership where both parties are collaborating, participating, whether or not they co-located, but I absolutely agree that, so to speak, skin in the game from both parties is very important because otherwise it does become a subcontracted project, a sponsored project by a company in the academic environment. So I think the education piece is very important and that's why we spend a lot of time on these types of programs. And just to give you an, an impression is that since Imperial has started investing in student entrepreneurship and education, the number of startups have gone up from about 10 a year up to 60, 70, 80, and every year there's new, and not all of them survive, but that's not important. It's the fact that students feel that they can go into this space, and increasingly it's in the healthcare space, which is notoriously difficult, particularly for young innovators to get into because of the complexity of the regulatory pathway. And, you know, more clarity and absolutely more interaction from you know, um, industry bodies, uh, institutions, and the continued work together to, to, to clarify that path is really important. And to say that it's all equally valid as we're all scientists, we're just doing science in a different way. Okay, great, thank you very much. We are going to the educational part in a few minutes, but in fact, in the last talks and, the, and, and your last moments, we heard about a lot on funding. Funding is something that we cannot get rid of it, uh, it's some. It's, it's an issue that is always present, uh, and Magda talked about difference between bigger uh, companies and smaller companies, and also we already talked about investments uh, landscape. So I would like to hear uh, Aureli, your uh, you, you talk about um, also in, in about funding. What challenges have to be talked in re in regulation policies and investments to allow development? Of, a, of an efficient ecosystem from the perspective from a health related small company and also a smaller biotech. And concerning the support from the product or drug or clinical development, is there a truly, in your opinion, is there a truly developed venture capital ecosystem in Europe capable enough to boost and implement innovation uh, emerge from smaller but high innovative companies and spin offs? Because that's something that we can have accelerator programs. We can have a lot of support in terms of academics and small uh, company projects. But after that, we will need a lot of money to, 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 make, to make things run. And venture capital ecosystem is something that's really important to take uh, these projects at least to the end, of, to the beginning of the market. So I want to, you to uh, listen about this. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Andrea. 
there's, there's never enough venture capital <laughs> for for small companies. Where, where but uh, if if I may, you know, venture capitalists are um, you know one one uh, one piece of a value chain. So as healthcare companies, uh, most of what we do is invest a lot of money for return that comes um, 20, 20, 15 years after the first investment with a probability of success of 5%. Um, so that means um, th it's a very capital intensive um, business we're in and a very risky business we're in. And so there are uh, each of, of the ecosystem members play a role. So um, providing innovation from academia and from the clinic, then usually um, the first, the first um, translation are coming from non dilutive funding from you know the research institutes from the governance uh, there's a lot of um, national investment fund that actually usually starts company and um, and uh, there's now also going back to education and support of um, new new um, new uh, entrepreneurs there's a lot of startup studios trainings incubators i think the ecosystem is blowing in this area so to help a lot uh, and venture capitalists are there to to support the investment uh, from the initial, I, I, you know, the initial startup to what they call exit, which is either you get bought by, <laughs> you get bought by a, a bigger yeah, company, by a bigger one, or you go on the market, on the public market. So um, you know, and and what that what that means is that the venture to 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 be um, to be more efficient, they need an exit. And so this exit is as important as the fund that the venture capitalists can provide. And so making sure our pharma companies are, are you know, are there, we talk to them, they're interested, they, they can support the ecosystem is, is important. And also the capital market. And in Europe, our capital market is not as, as um, as as good and as flourishing as uh, probably in the US or in Asia, so that's that's definitely uh, a weakness of our of, of our uh, um, region and something that will help. But on the venture capitalist front, I think they're very much there. They're quite um, professional. Um, they're probably more product driven than technology driven yeah. uh, in terms of how they see uh, a project. But they're very much engaged. Uh, we we need more of them, but they're definitely more engaged. And on your first question, which was um, regarding policy investments and regulation, I think something that I heard from many of you um, is about training um, and people realizing they all can participate to um, to the to the advance of science in different ways. And so the, it's a little bit of a generation issue, uh, you know. If you've been trained and never heard about, as 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 um, Fabrice mentioned, never heard about entrepreneur before, you know, 20 years, you know, you learn uh, you learn when you have to learn. But if you're you you hear that as part of your training and you're supported as after your training, then it just helps a lot because everybody comes with the same understanding of where we why we're there together and why is it that we can collaborate together and so this is really uh, critical and then the second piece is again a generation issue as a biotech that grows we need experienced people that have done that in the past uh, because we cannot invent everything and so uh, the more people that have had experience in biotech you know for 10 years and can come and support new uh, companies, uh, the better it is. And here we're in terms of experienced talent. Uh, um, we're not, you know, we probably would need more experienced talent in Europe to foster all these startups that start and that gets to a point where they really need like people that know how to run projects um, and you know, go to the market, and that's where there's probably you know some limitation in terms of how many talents are available to the number of biotechs that start and have a good innovation to to foster. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fabrice. Um, 
Magda uh, and Viera and also and also Rally uh, mentioned that education and training is in fact something that is absolutely critical for all this process can uh, can work. But you mentioned before something that is really important that I use it quite quite often actually this term culture. The organization culture of research institutions and hospitals can make all the difference and this culture is is spread out and is different also among countries. It's not just among institutions or, 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 or hospitals or people. It's the organizational culture. So you mentioned culture. So I would like to, to go to that. So which kind of organizational culture, in your opinion, you think that should be implemented, for example, into an hospital? Because sometimes the relation between clinicians and academics are not so easy. Um, and so which kind of, of culture do we, do we should have? Uh, in order to stimulate this relationship between researchers and clinicians, or in the other hand, which barriers uh, do we need to broke down to, to facilitate this dialogue between hospitals and research centers if they are not so well uh, connected? I think, André, I, I would try to be uh, clear a few points. The first is, what is the output of research? On which criteria you evaluate academics? The only criteria for us is whether you change the outcome of patient. There is no other criteria. Publication is not an output of research. It's a surrogate marker. Yeah, it comes up. So the only way to change patient outcome, I mean, one of the way is to create uh, uh, companies because they ultimately lead to product. So this is the first thing is to change the output of research. Second is to allow young people to be incubated for a long time. Again, is the same question of output of research. The problem is the what we call incremental research. What is killing Europe is incremental research. There is absolutely no reason we do incremental research. We should do breakthrough research. To do breakthrough research, we need people to incubate for a very long time and leave them uh, leave them incubate and say you come back in 10 years with something that is a, a major uh, transformation. Another point is developing research on technology. In France, there is no incentive to do research on technology. It, it's, it's a major problem because we love the beauty of academic, of mechanism, but we don't develop research on economics. A lot of value now on technology. A lot of value now is on technology. Last point is uh, what is the presence of the tech transfer department? Of course, if the tech transfer department is totally is not in, in the hospital and is not, you know, uh, rewarded. <laughs> nobody will see, uh, nobody will generate uh, IP and we need success story. Of course, if someone from your team has created a company and is uh, very successful, of course, you will uh, that incentive. Then I will add the last point that is outside your question, but maybe for the debate. We can discuss whatever we want. If we don't have reimbursement of biomarkers in Europe, it's just theoretical discussion. Because at the end, what convinces a VC to put money is whether there is a return on investment. So unless we develop an internal market on biomarker, biomarker testing, we, we don't need to have all this discussion because if there is no market, there is no private investment, there is no company, there is nothing. So the, the, the only parameter to change in Europe, the first one is to reimburse biomarkers. If we don't do that, I think it's, it's useless to have a discussion on, uh, you know, startup, precision medicine and all these things. Yeah, great. I totally agree with you. Actually, uh, you mentioned uh, the, the biomarkers and it's becoming more evident that biomarkers are playing an important role in increasing the likelihood of approval of new molecular entities. Um, entering into the market and it's also contributing to, to increase the confidence of, of and precision of new uh, therapeutic drugs. Yes, but I'm sorry to say that it's only the same way. It's yeah. only when a pharma can yeah. sell a drug because of the biomarker, yes, because then they send the, find the, the way to, 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 to develop it. The problem is the other one is when you need complex technology for precision medicine to decrease the number of treatments. Example, if tomorrow you have a multi-biomarker testing to decrease 
the number of, of patients receive immunotherapeutics. There is no way in Europe you can get a reimbursement if you are a biotech company. It, it's impossible. We have some example uh, of company, French companies who sell their product in US, but not in, in, in France, for example. Mm. Yeah. So. I don't think we have Magda with us, but I would like to have Magda to commenting this. No. Okay. Uh, okay. Do you want to comment uh, this last part of Fabis because it's, it's it's quite challenging? So you were asked. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I was not. Um, enforcement of biomarkers. Yeah. So uh, I think you know Fabrice is is making a good point. You know, uh, biotech that use a biomarker to actually be able to define the patient population uh, that will benefit their treatment. It's easy finding a biomarker that will allow uh, reduction of healthcare costs that are existing. Um, you know, it, it's as as a biotech company, I don't know who you're referring to, Fabrice, but as a biotech company trying to sell a biomarker, but that's not supports um, uh, a, a specific treatment. It, it's a harder it's a harder situation to be in. I, I would agree with, with that. Um, and I think it's really um, having a comprehensive view um, as a reimbursement uh, agency, having a comprehensive view of healthcare costs and how each intervention, whether they are treatment or uh, or biomarkers that supports uh, preservation of treatment or removal of treatment, I think that's the way um, we, we can advance on that topic. Okay, maybe just to add something, André, on this. Yes, I think we are running. I don't know if we have some questions from the audience, but, I, yeah, I, but maybe just to comment on the, this, this debate, um, and I, I cannot agree more. And um, I, what I'm hearing is why in Europe don't we have uh, the same level of investment as we can see in the other part of the world, like in the US or in Asia now? There's a business here. There's a return on investment for the people who are putting their resources in the other places on the planet. So why in Europe do we, don't we see the interest on the technology investment? Uh, I think it's, those are missed opportunities, but I would turn it more on the positive side. There are opportunities for Europe to change now. We need to create incentives. There are incentives here, and uh, we, we, we should react quickly not to lose the momentum, because what happens usually from big companies, you know, they try to get around the places where science is, is, um, is active, okay? So you establish, so you used to look at Cambridge, you know, in the US, this is the place where you have a, a cluster, a hotspot of institutions, you know, where you have a lot of talents and uh, that could create a lot of knowledge. If you think about it carefully, Europe is an incredible place where we have institutional knowledge, you know, and uh, when Viera said this is a young university uh, in Poland, 110 years, said it's young for 100, you know, it did not even exist in some part of the US, you know, 100 years ago or something. So we have such an opportunity in Europe <coughs> that we are not leveraging. And if we continue this way, it's going to be an exit of the of the the, the, the not only the investment but the the brains. Okay, so the talented people will go where it's a kind of uh, attraction where there's a dynamic. If I am an entrepreneur now, I have the entrepreneur spirit because I have it in my in my genes. I can probably said you, you have it, and I want to change the world. I want to have an impact. Will I get it where I am today in Europe? I don't know, I would question that twice. I know in other places, they will give you a long-term perspective to realize your, it's not, the, it's not the, the green, the, the grass is not always greener elsewhere. It's not that easy, but it's easy, it's better. It's better and we know it. So it's time to change and I will tell you, turn it as an opportunity. Precision medicine now, or personalized medicine, is a great opportunity. We are talking about immuno-oncology, I've heard about it recently. It's just incredible, but nobody was ex expecting 10 years ago, 15 years ago, that there would be such a kind of change, you know, in the oncology uh, portfolio, you know, on how many things are coming. They are coming. So science is there and there's even more to come. I heard today about um, the the uh, uh, microbiome. We are, we don't even understand all of, all of that, right? So more to come on this area and that would potentially provide a lot of opportunities. So for, for personalized medicine, there should be a push. An ecosystem has to be formed. It's not going to be there naturally, okay? And I think some parts of the of the world have understood that they create the um, the ecosystem and they favor it, okay, to ensure that they get all 
or uh, or they can out of it. I think for me in Europe we have all the resources needed. We have all the brains, you know, all the the knowledge that we could we could take the lead and and I'm including UK in this uh, Viera, right? So it's somehow somehow Europe, but but you understand what I mean. So and we are losing this momentum of the big strong knowledge. But I tell it more as a positive aspect. So there's an opportunity for everyone to uh, to emerge. I, I think we are very close to the to the limit. I'm, I'm looking at Monica. She's looking at us, you know, in a, in a, she's smiling, but she's challenging us. Monica, do, how much time do we still have? We are done. OK, OK, maybe I, I start first and we can give it away. So I would like to thank all the speakers and the, the panelists for that exciting conversations. We would have had an additional hours. We could have gone even deeper, but I guess yeah. we have we have we have touched some of the critical and the social points. Thank yeah. you for your participation. Andre. Definitely, it was an honor for me also to be here. It was a great discussion. Unfortunately, we are running out of time, but uh, it was a pleasure to be here and talk with all of you. It was uh, it was great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, also from our side. And I was thinking we have a few questions in the session chat. So if you are staying still with us a little bit, so maybe you have the chance, uh, the speakers, the panel, um, well, to answer uh, the question directly in the chat. So uh, like this, um, well, if you have time to stay a little bit longer with us, <laughs> but. Again, also from our side, thanks a lot for your participation. Thanks a lot for the interesting talks and the great panel discussion. Thanks a lot uh, to André and Saladin for moderating the session. And we are back here at around six o'clock. So see you soon again. Thanks a lot. <laughs>